Welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue on with verse number 65, which reads as follows. Muhutampi je vinyu panditang payiru pasati Kipang dhammang vijanati jiuha suparasangyata yatha Which means, very similar to the last one, but here we're talking about the opposite. When you, a wise person, muhutampi te, if, if a wise person, even for a moment, panditang bayirupasati, should attend upon or, or hang out with a wise person, kipang dhammang vijanati, they're quick to know the to understand the Dhamma. Jyuhasu parasangyata. Just as the tongue is quick to know the taste of the soup. Just as the tongue to the soup, a, a wise person is able to quickly understand the Dhamma of a wise person uh, by hanging out with a wise person, even for a short time. So this is again an, a rather short story, but we can provide a little bit of background. This is in relation to these, the group of 30 um, friends who, the story goes, were out cavorting in the forest with their wives. And one of them didn't have a wife, so they hired a courtesan for her, for him, an escort, I guess. contacted, looked in the yellow pages and found an escort service and something like the equivalent of the yellow pages where you find an escort in those times. The courtesan and, uh, invited her along to to be his wife for the day. So they went into the forest and they're playing in the water and they took off all their clothes, jump in the water and are sporting around. And uh, while they're in the water, if I'm not making this up, either they were in the water or they were asleep, I can't remember which it was. Anyway, while they were negligent, this courtesan runs off with all their jewels, goes picking through their clothes and gathers up all their valuables and runs off into the forest. When they get back and find their clothes, uh, missing all the jewels, they realize right away what happened and they start they send their wives home, I guess, it doesn't say about that, but they go off into the forest, these 30 men, trying to find this courtesan and get back their jewels. Uh, the, just so, it just so happens that the Buddha, the Buddha having taught the five, the group of five ascetics in Isipatana, having turned the wheel of Dhamma, and then having uh, enlightened Yasa and all of his 54 friends, and having sent the total of 60 arahants off into the world to spread the teaching, no two of them going in one direction. So he sent them all throughout India. He went himself off to Rajagaha to spread the Dhamma there, to Uruvela. And there, there he would find Kasapa, Uruvela Kasapa and the other two Kasapa brothers and eventually go off and teach Bimbisara and spread his teaching in Rajagaha. But first, he did something that appears in the in the texts, he stopped off where these 30 men were running around the forest trying to find this courtesan. And he stopped under a tree, and just sat there in meditation, and these 30 men wandered upon him. And they looked and they said, oh, he looks like a wise person, I bet he can give us some good advice. And so they wandered up to him and uh, paid respect, gave, gave him respect, and then asked him, Venerable Sir, um, you, you see you look like you've been, been sitting here in the forest for a while, and we wonder if you happen to have seen this woman. We're looking for a woman who stole our jewels. Not exactly the sort of advice that most people would ask the Buddha for. And, but the Buddha, Buddha gives them something much more valuable. He's, he, he, he looks at them 
and he knows the reason he's there is because he knows the uh, the ability or the 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 qualities of these thirty men to be they're uh, highly cultivated individuals, even though they don't realize it. And so he said, he asks them. He says, "What what is which do you think is better?" that you should search after a woman or that you should search after yourself you know, search, search after yourselves not exactly the advice they were looking for huh? and of course this is the Buddha and so the they take they, they, they take in what he's saying and they say of course it's much more Important, really. Even all the jewels that we lost are not really all that valuable in comparison to finding oneself, which actually sounds kind of non-Buddhist if you think about it. Buddhism is all about giving up yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Giving up the idea of self. But it's a, it's, and, and so a lot is made of this passage actually. Those people who think that the Buddha actually taught that there is a self or uh, had some idea of there being self. But it's um, it was quite clear from the Buddhist teaching that that's not the case, and this is simply a, 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 t a teaching instrument, right? How to get the people, how to get them to look for something that's truly valuable. And there probably were Hindus, or whatever would have been, and they were Brahmin of the Brahmin religion, so they would have believed in a self, and so it's a good way to get people's attention to say, well, why don't why don't you seek out what is truly important? Seek out yourselves. Come to know yourselves and learn about yourselves. And he said, "Well, then sit down and and I'll I'll help you find yourselves." And they had them sit down, and he teaches them the Dhamma, and they all became enlightened right there. I don't know how many people have ever become enlightened listening to my Dhamma. Probably not, not not in the same category, I suppose. But it can happen, you know. Sometimes listening to a talk, if if you're clearly aware of the experience during the time that you're listening to the talk, it's useful because one, you can't go anywhere, and two, the, the teaching constantly reminds you of good things. Three, the company of the, the fellow audience members are all ideally on, on the same path. And so there are there are good qualities to the experience of listening to the Dhamma that you don't get elsewhere. During that time, it actually quite, can be quite easy to, to, to realize the teachings, realize the truth of the Buddha's teachings, to, to find the truth, to understand reality. And so they did, these 30 young men, became arahants and decided to become, and obviously decided to become monks and uh, proceeded along with the Buddha. I'm not sure where they went actually, they, maybe they went off on their own somewhere. But the uh, the other monks were talking about this later, and this is what, how this verse came up. They said, well this is kind of crazy, you know, all of us would take so much work and you know, maybe these monks weren't yet arahants, but they were, or maybe they were, but uh, how long it took them to practice over the days and weeks and months and even years to become arahants. But these 30, guy, 30 young men who were earlier in the same day uh, frolicking in, in uh, negligence, you know, in indolence, and then suddenly they can become arahants. How, how is that? And the Buddha came in and asked them, what are you talking about? And they said, oh, we're talking about this. And then the Buddha said, well. And then he actually told one of the Jatakas based on this. He said, uh, or he reminded them of a Jataka. Of, uh, once in, the, in a past life he had taught these 30. These 30 men were coming to kill him and he uh, was able to uh, help them realize the, the, the error of their ways. And, and as a result, they... Uh, gave up their, gave up their evil and became disciples of his. But um, the meaning behind it is that they had they had a lot 
coming into this. They, we call upanisaya, they brought from their past lives. And we all bring this from our past lives. We come into this life with qualities, both positive and negative. The fact that we're born human means we um, definitely still are born with unwholesome qualities. Everyone, even the bodhisattva, was born as a human being, has to still have greed, still have anger, still have delusion. And without those, we wouldn't be born again as a human. So we have these, we have negative qualities, but we also carry all the positive qualities of all that we've cultivated in our past lives, all the good work that we've done in uh, in in the in Buddhism and outside of Buddhism, helping other people, um, being moral and and ethical and and high-minded and spiritually minded and being inclined towards the spiritual life I inside Buddhism, within Buddhism and, and, without, and outside of it as well. All the wisdom that we've gained, all the learning that we've gained from lifetime to lifetime, it, do it doesn't leave us except insofar as our memories go. Memories, of course, fade away uh, as they always do over time. But the, uh, the quality of the mind changes, as we're all aware of as Buddhists. And so the Buddha said, it, it's because of Vinyu, because these, these men are Vinyu, they're people who understand, people who have this, this resonance in them, the, the, the potential to resonate with the Dhamma. Just as the tongue has the potential, a person with a, without their tongue damaged, yeah, their sense of taste damaged, unless their sense of taste is damaged, uh, they have the, the potential to uh, receive, the, receive whatever the taste of the soup is quite quickly, without any effort. Unlike the spoon, which we talked about last week. The spoon, no matter how long it touches the soup, it never tastes anything. It's all about one's potential. So the point is that the Dhamma is good uh, good in and of itself. There's nothing wrong with the Dhamma just because we can't become enlightened off of it. It's, all, it's up to our qualities, as we talked about last week. If we don't have those qualities, we spend all the time we want with enlightened beings and if we're if our deeds and our speech and our thoughts are unwholesome and are, un are not inclined towards enlightenment then we'll never get there it's, it's useless it's it's like being the spoon with the soup but um, the quality of a, of, of a wise person is that they quickly understand the truth. Even when you when they're just taught the Buddha's teachings from the books, they immediately get the under, get the meaning of it, or they very quickly get the meaning of it. Some people, when they hear the Buddha's teaching, are, are confused and disinterested, turned off even, repelled by the Buddha's teaching when they hear about it being for the giving up, you know, the discarding of sensual desire, and or the giving up and uh, of the whole world. You know. They think of this as a ridiculous, a horrible thing, a bad teaching, a teaching that is built on repression and 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 so on and so on. And the misunderstandings that arise come from a, a, a different a different sort of person, you know, a different sort of personality. Those people who are inclined towards the world, inclined towards craving and, and attachment, they aren't able to understand the teaching. And so that's a, it's a common question, how do, how do these monks in the time of the Buddha hear the Buddha giving a talk, and some people just immediately became arahant, very quickly, like Sariputta. Sariputta didn't even have to hear from the Buddha, he, he heard from Asaji, this, um, one of the first five monks, one of the five ascetics. And he just heard half of a stanza, and he became a sotapanna, just from hearing half of the stanza. Ye dhamma he tu pabhava ye uh, dhamma he tu pabhava te uh, sang he tung tathagata ahu That's it. You just turn that. Whatever dhammas arise based on a cause, the tathagata has spoken of that cause. That's it. Became a sotapanna. He was ready for it. That's the, the, the very sensitive tongue. <laughs> I quickly was able to realize the teaching. So, what does this mean for all of us? Um, it means that realistically, we should first of all we we should never fault the teaching. 
just because it doesn't bring us anything. If we can find fault with the teaching in, 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 a, in an intellectual sense, this is, a, this is when we should give up the teaching. But when we find the teaching doesn't work, we have to ask ourselves one of two things. Is, is the teaching ineffective or are we unable to understand the teaching? Are we un unable to understand and put it into practice? There's these two ways. When you see enlightened be beings, and this is the key, is if you, your teacher is, is full of greed and full of anger and full of delusion, you think, oh, maybe that's not, maybe it's my teacher's fault or the teaching is, is impure. But when you know that your teacher is like the Buddha, when we know that we have the Buddha and um, when we see that people who practice meditation are, are able to free themselves from these things, then, then we have to understand that it's most likely our own fault. That we ourselves are just lacking in the requisites to quickly understand the teaching. Now, it's the first part. The second part is not to be discouraged, not to be quickly discouraged because after a week of practicing, I'm still not enlightened. You know? Here I have, here I've been sitting for 10 minutes and I don't feel anything yet. That kind of thing. You have to understand that the, part of this is the cultivation. Tolkang, tolkang, the Buddha said, uh, drop by drop or little by little. And goodness doesn't come to you all at once. It's something that you cultivate little by little every moment. Every moment that we're mindful, every moment that we're aware of something, that we're clearly aware of experience just as it is without liking and disliking or judgment or attachment or conceit or views. That moment is blessed, that moment is great. If we can cultivate those moments again and again, continuously, eventually it becomes habitual, and that's when we're able to understand the Dhamma. And for example, when you learn about Buddhism before you practice meditation, it's, it's a lot less clear than after you actually sit down and practice the teaching and then approach the same text. You find that you understand them so much better and so much clearer and so much more uh, fruitfully and your studies are of far greater fruit because of your practice. So it's not to be discouraged. Um, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't think that we're, we're useless, just be, you know, we're not like this, we shouldn't think we're the spoon. Um, it, we, should all, we should look at our own attitude is the point. That we shouldn't be like Udayi, this guy who um, just hung out with the Buddha and pretended to be wise but never really listened to what the Buddha had to say or put it into practice or tried to understand it even. We should always try to put the teachings into practice, try to understand them more and try to apply them to our own life, not to just keep them up in our head or chant them or teach them to others or think about them. But we should actually try every, every day and in every aspect of our lives to incorporate them into our lives. How can we be more generous? How can we be more moral? How can we be more focused and concentrated and uh, clear in our minds? And cultivating goodness, you know, the three types of goodness, and cultivating morality and concentration and wisdom. Most importantly, using mindfulness to cultivate it all, because mindfulness is what clears the mind and allows you to see the difference between wholesome and unwholesome, and allows you to uh, keep the mind from wandering in unwholesome ways, focus the mind and see things clearly. That's what leads us to Nibbāna, freedom from suffering. It's just, the, the meaning is it's all on us. It's up to us whether we're going to be the spoon or the tongue. So the analogy ends there. It doesn't mean that if you're a spoon, you're always going to be a spoon. It just means don't be a spoon, be a tongue. And try to receive the teachings. Cultivate knowledge and understanding so you can understand the teachings. And don't, be, don't think that just because you've memorized all the Buddha's teachings or you know how to practice meditation, uh, that, that you're a Buddhist or that you're practicing the Buddhist teaching. You should never take that for granted. You find that the more you practice and the longer that you um, associate with Buddhism, with the Buddhist teaching, the, the deeper your understanding of the same teachings gets and you realize that there are still things that you're missing and it gets more and more refined and your sense of taste uh, becomes more and more refined until you can taste the Dhamma, which has the taste of freedom. So, simple verse, simple story, simple meaning. And you have to cultivate knowledge and understanding. Understanding of the Buddha's teaching requires us to be ready for it, or us to have be in a condition to understand the truth. So, that's the story for tonight.
the teaching on the Dhammapada. Thank you for tuning in and for coming out, all of those who are here locally. I wish you all to find true peace, happiness, and freedom from suffering.